paragraph out of revival study Bible <clears throat> that I have. It's got all these different things through history of uh, moves of God, revival breaking out. <clears throat> so I'm not even sure how to say this word, but it's called the Hebrides Revival in Scotland, 1949 to 1952. God came with power. <clears throat> During the service, tears and suppressed sobs showed this was no ordinary occasion, that it was the day of the Lord's power. When the benediction was pronounced, a few retired, but the great majority lingered, stood, in fact, as if held in a vice or bound with a chain. In a moment, as if struck with a thunderbolt from above, a hundred persons were prostrated on their knees, sending forth a wail from hearts bruised, broken, and overwhelmed with horror, such as will never be forgotten, and the solemnity and awe of which we will perhaps never be surpassed until Judgment Day. For hours, these stricken, smitten, bleeding souls remained on their knees, unconscious of everything but their own guilt and danger and need of a Savior, pleading and praying with an intensity and fervor which surpasses all description. The meeting fell as still as a grave, a fearless stillness. <clears throat> this terrifying silence was suddenly shattered by unearthly cries from different parts of the church. People lay prostrate as the Spirit revealed terrifying and glorious realities. One well-educated mer merchant suddenly saw hell open up before his eyes. An irresistible force seemed to be pushing him head first into the abyss. For a moment, he cried in his heart, my sins, my sins, I am lost. And he ran out of the church. Later, he said, had anyone asked me, where are you going? I would have answered, I'm going to hell. For hours in his room, he cried for mercy until God's promises came to his mind and he seized them. Heavenly radiance spread over his soul and he, ar and he arose a Christian. I don't know how they determine that, but that's. <clears throat> <clears throat> he raced out into the night across town and knocked on his business partner's door. When he opened it, he called, I have found Christ and have come to tell you. They prayed together. Three days later, his partner was converted. So I'm pretty sure there was more has more to do with that. That's just one particular story of this revival breaking out and there being in that, which I've seen this over and over again, there's an encounter when revival really breaks out, there's an encounter with God and a reality of heaven and hell. And <clears throat> it's very normal for people to repent of sin when revival breaks out. And if you think about how it is in the word of God, when Peter was in the presence of Jesus and Jesus showed himself, he manifested the glory of God on his life, Peter says, he, he grabbed his clothes, right? He tried to get back dressed because he realized he was in the presence of God, not just an ordinary man. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah, when he came into the temple, saw the glory of God. The first thing he said, I'm undone. <clears throat> I'm a man of unclean lips. And over and over again in the Bible, encounters uh, that people had with God always brought them to their knees in repentance and realizing their shortcomings and realizing how much they lack and how big God is. And so this is not unusual, and this happens a lot of times in revival. There's a reality of heaven and hell. There's a reality of, of having to turn from sin. There's a reality of God, right? So I thought I'd read that one, and uh, we'll continue. This is a big Bible if you've seen it. And so there's a lot of stories. <laughs> I don't think I'll run out finding a story for us every week. Um, <clears throat> tonight, I want to go into Nehemiah. We're going to continue in the book of Nehemiah. And what we've done in Nehemiah, we've gone through a few chapters, and we started out with the prayer of Nehemiah, and then we, we talked about uh, the character of Nehemiah. 
And I think one time uh, David Hart spoke, he spoke on the doors or the, uh, the portals, the gates of the city uh, that they were rebuilding all the gates and, and in Nehemiah, it goes through and lists all the gates and I can't remember how many there are, but there's gates all the way around the city and each gate had a different purpose. And every one of those gates in their, in their purpose, their, their name, uh, there is a meaning to, there's a spiritual emphasis to it. And so we're looking at spiritual application to all the things that are in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, remember, when I started the book of Nehemiah, we talked about Nehemiah being a book that talks about revival. It talks about a fresh move of God. And it talks about a lot, of, a, a lot to do with that and uh, confronting the enemies in our life and being able to move forward in God because there is a perseverance. There is a standing sure, a standing true in the Lord through everything that comes our way that we know, that we know, that we know, that we know he is God. And there is no other. There is none like him. And <clears throat> we will bow the knee to no other one. So as we continue on in the book of Nehemiah, um, chapter 4, we're going to go ahead and, and jump into chapter 4. And <clears throat> chapter 4, they start rebuilding the wall. And it's kind of interesting. I'm just going to bring out some different things, but let's go ahead and start reading in uh, Nehemiah chapter 4 uh, from verse 1. When Sanballat, I, and I don't know how to pronounce all these names. I never took Hebrew, so... I made up my own pronunciation a long time ago, and then I change it around. So if I say it weird, don't judge me. <laughs> Just don't judge me. <laughs> when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, remember Sanballat is one of the enemies. There's three or four enemies, Tobiah, Sanballat, I think there's one or two others. Uh, and, and the enemies, uh, I think we've, we may have talked about this all right, already, but uh, most of the enemies don't actually come from the outside. They actually come from the inside. Have you ever figured that out? It's really a strange thing. There are more enemies within the church than without. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates, and the army of Samaria, Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, <clears throat> who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. So you can see this, where all that's going, right? And here, here comes a prayer. Uh, Hear us, O God, verse 4, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted. Did you hear that line? When the gaps were being closed, the walls were being built, repaired, the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Did you know the enemy gets very angry when you start closing the gaps? <clears throat> They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said the strength of the, of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said before they know it or see us, we will be right up there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. 
Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked at things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes, which I think is one of the key lines in this chapter. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half my men <clears throat> did the work while the other half were equipped with spear shields, bowers, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. This is another key part of chapter 4 is the trumpet. <clears throat> then I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God <clears throat> will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper Stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. So there's a lot of interesting things in this chapter that I think apply to our Christian walk. And one of them, as you can see towards the end, they didn't take off their clothes. They didn't get ready for bed because they were always prepared for battle. They, they slept, they rested, but they were always prepared for battle. And I think it's interesting, I've heard, I've heard this uh, said several times, probably in the past year, is Ephesians chapter 6 talks to us and says, put on the whole armor of God. And he never says at the end, take off the armor of God. We're to put it on and keep it on. We're always supposed to be ready. And throughout the chapter, uh, Nehemiah 4 uh, we find the way that Nehemiah prepared the men and the women. They were always ready for the enemy coming at them. They never closed their eyes. They never turned their back on what could possibly take place. They did not give place to the enemy, nor did they uh, just turn their backs or go blind by his tactics or by the enemy coming at them. And I think it's important for us to understand as, as Christians that we need to be aware, we need to be alert, because our adversary goes to and fro looking for who he may devour. We shouldn't be demon hunters, right? We shouldn't be, sometimes I think as Christians, we find a demon behind every rock. I don't think that's our stance, but at the same time, we need to be always aware and alert that the enemy is prowling, the enemy is looking for an entrance. Uh, one, one verse, I think is in Ephesians chapter 4, is, uh, how does it put it? If you, if you let your anger, don't let your anger go past, go into the next day because you'll give a place to the devil. In other words, you'll give a foothold. What's that? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. You can give a foothold to the devil, right? He gets his foot in the door. Now, it's interesting in this chapter 4 how it's talking about the walls being built. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to compare the walls being built to uh, the city of Jerusalem and the walls being built to our souls, who we are as people. And <clears throat> a lot of this, if you, if you think about it and start applying it uh, in, in, in the way of looking at rebuilding the walls that are broken down how many walls are broken down in our soul how many places uh, in our life uh, are broken down where the enemy has come in he's trodden and he's been taking authority he's been taking place in our life and as we come into the lord we go through all these processes we go through all this this uh, 
continually growing and closing things out, severing things out, and growing in the Lord, bringing our soul into oneness with our spirits, which is Jesus Christ, right? So there is... Um, <clears throat> Let me, if I don't look at my notes, I'll get carried away and forget about them. When, 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 when someone is doing the work of the Lord, when you're, when you're going after the Lord, you're going to have attacks. The enemy is going to come against you when you begin taking steps towards the Lord. It's, it's kind of a, you know, we, we tell people a lot of times when we're talking to them, said, man, give your life to the Lord. Life is going to be great. And it is great but not without trouble. And uh, we always want to spare people from the trouble, but the trouble is because God is freeing us and taking us into a better freedom, a better place than we've ever been before. And the enemy is trying to hold us back in where our flesh is, hold us back into the things of the world. And so there is, there is opposition when you start moving towards God, especially when you start asking the Lord to help you uh, to grow, for your soul to get healed. Uh, John, third John, and I think it's verse 2, says, I wish above all things that you prosper even as your soul prospers. Or I wish above all things that you will grow, you will, you will have more, even as your soul gets along well. <clears throat> oh, that's what the NIV says. How about that? <clears throat> and <clears throat> we have a song about that, don't we? It is well with my soul. I think that's why that song touches me every time I hear it, because there's there's something about, like that scripture, I could just take off on that, that one verse because I believe that as our soul prospers or as our soul gets along well, and do you understand getting along well in our soul? When peace is restored, when joy is restored, when righteousness is restored in our soul, right? Right? When things begin to change, there's no, there's no longer all these other chains and all these other things. When you start living in true freedom and your soul is growing in that way, everything else begins a dom domino effect and it all comes into place. True prosperity never begins from the outside. It always begins from the inside. True prosperity is not having a fat bank account. True prosperity is being free from the bank account. <clears throat> so it's just a really cool thing when you start realizing the importance of growing our, our soul area, not grow, well, yes, growing it, uh, but healing and making, our, making our, our, our innards whole, making our life whole, right? Making everything that's about us whole again. And all of us are broken. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> am I in the right set of notes? I wrote this down. When <clears throat> the enemy sees that you're finishing the work, when you're getting to a finishing point, and you don't stop him, the enemy, he will want to come in so that you accept his presence and believe his lies. Does that make sense? When you just start, just start getting along with him. <clears throat> and that's what they did. You remember that? We read that in the scripture. They, they wanted to come alongside. They just wanted to come alongside so that they could attack them. 
without them knowing what was going on. <clears throat> it's a subtle tactic of the enemy. <clears throat> And I wrote it this way. And a lot of times these attacks come at the moment that we're very close to victory and we're the most tired. We're very close to victory and we're getting weary. And the enemy will take advantage of those moments in our life. So <clears throat> as we go through this chapter, and I read the chapter so that you could kind of remember what was going on there. I want you to realize that there's some things that take place in this chapter that I think apply to us as a body, as, first of all, individuals, Christians, and also saying that as individuals, we don't have to stand alone. We stand in part of an army. We stand together, one another, and we don't have to do all of this by ourselves. As a matter of fact, there's a much greater strength when we start coming together and we're covering our brothers. We're covering for each other. Because uh, if you remember, as they were doing it, he had some stay guard and some work. And then he talked about some, they kept their sword on their side, so they were always ready. But some were always watching, some were always working. And they would switch. They'd take turns and do that. So they'd watch each other's backs. And one of the things that Nehemiah said uh, the scripture that I highlighted was that you, you're fighting, you're not just fighting for yourself, you're fighting for your family, you're fighting for your brothers, your sisters, you're fighting, you're fighting for everybody that's around you. You're not just fighting for yourself. Let me put it this way. Your healing of your soul, the growth and the maturing of your soul, and the healing of your soul is not about you, but it's about others. It helps you, but as a consequence, it is going to help others because you can't get someone out of a ditch if you're in the ditch with them. Right? You can't. Uh, one thing I've, I've, I've seen over the years when the prodigal ended up in the pig's pen and he, it says he ended up in the pig's pen, he had nobody around him anymore. And nobody gave him anything, and he came to himself. It says he came to himself. He said, even in my father's house, the servants have a roof, and they have food to eat. I'll go back, and I'll be a servant. I won't even be a son anymore. I've, I've already burned that bridge. I'll just go back and be a servant. But the point being, nobody helped him. And I remember a friend uh, said this one time. He said... Uh, it's okay. He's, he said, had humanitarians thrown lifelines into the pig's pen, the prodigal would have never come back to the father. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Go ahead. So how, um, in regards to the prodigal not coming back, how do you relate that to the scripture? To the Nehemiah story. Yeah. Well, everything we talked about was spiritual, but we were all broken. Yet, um, he needed the growth and the healing and the restoration. There were a couple things going on in my mind when you talk about brokenness because I'm thinking Christ comes with them, and that's our restorer. Yeah. Yet he talks about um, if, if where the strong, first the enemy would have to come in and bind the strong man in order to take over that house, and the analogous for me is us, our, our temple, and him being in this house. So while Christ is in, and we're exercising that, I have a hard time with the enemy taking up space with Christ and then yeah I don't he's not I don't I'm not saying he is but the, that's the strong man in us I just want you to talk about that for a second okay so the picture that I would give is when Christ comes in our life uh, and this is 
just going down basically so we can, this is the way I understand it. My spirit without Christ is dead. And I must have Christ. I cannot, my spirit cannot live without Christ. He makes me alive in my spirit. And my spirit, my spirit man is Christ himself. He's a full grown man. He's God. And he is, he is in my spirit. So in my spirit, there is no room for Satan. There's no room for the enemy. He can't touch my spirit. That belongs to God. I've, I've given myself to the Lord. The Lord has, come, has brought me alive. He's quickened me. Quicken means make alive. He's, he's, he's translated me into life. Now, as my life is hidden, my soul, which is my mind, my emotions, my personality, all those things, forget about the body. The body, we just inhabit the body. The body's, body becomes a big problem if we give it a lot of attention, which we do. And more attention we give to our body, it drags our soul into the bondages. And uh, because we open doors through our body to get to our soul. We also open doors through our spirit to get to our soul. So it's this battle going back and forth, right? And that's why there's enmity between the spirit and the soul or, or the spirit and the flesh man. So our spirit man comes alive with Christ. Satan can't, he can't occupy that. He can't come in. That's why when people say uh, Christians have demons, well, you have to explain that. I don't believe Christians can have demons like be demon possessed. They cannot because Christ and Satan cannot inhabit the same place. They can't. It's just, I mean, that's just common sense to me. They can't. Uh, Christ is not going to sit there and say, hey, what are you doing here? Come have a cup of coffee with me, right? It's not going to happen. So uh, there's, there's, there's that. <clears throat> but there are demons that attach themselves to our souls, uh, and they come at us through these bondages, through these different things that we allow in our life or that have been done to us. Because of things that have happened to us, uh, doors have been opened, uh, different access has been given to our life through abuse, through words, through experiences, through a lot of things in our life, and, and stuff starts attaching uh, to us. And so demons attach themselves to things in us. Does that make sense? They attach themselves to bitterness. They attach themselves to, to, to unforgiveness. They attach themselves... Uh, to sickness, things like that. So um, I think that, that helps a little bit with that part, right? So there's, the conflict comes in that there are attacks, but, for, but we need to feed off of our spirit versus feeding off of our flesh. We feed from the spirit, from Christ, and our life should be hidden in Christ. So we're finding our life in him and bringing our soul into likeness to the Christ man, to the spirit. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it grieves the Holy Spirit unless we embrace them more than we embrace him. I mean, for some of it, yeah, I don't think it, I don't know that about, about it grieving him. I, I think God wants us to come into full freedom. And it would be nice if God just cleaned it all up. But that's the part, that's the process of possessing the promised land. Through the promises of God, we become partakers of the divine nature. So here's your divine nature in our spirit. And we partake of the divine nature step by step as we take hold of the promises. And through the promises, we are taking on the nature of God. We're taking on his divine presence into our life and hiding more and more of our soul so um and that that's part of this whole process of rebuilding the walls i think is is that building our soul to the place that the enemy has no access any longer so we're closing doors off right we're and and here's the thing and i can't do this justice in one night but uh the thing is you can go through years of being free from something and then it can crop back up because you give yourself back to it. And I wish it wasn't that way, but it is because whatever you give yourself to, you, it becomes your master. 
doesn't matter if we've been Christian for 20 years. Like the statement I made, that, you know, we're just almost at the point of victory, and then you're, you're just so tired. It's like, man, I'm just tired of fighting. I'm tired of the battle. I'm just tired of it. And, and you get to a place where you start falling back and you ease into uh, the past, the comfortable place. Faith. Yeah, I have not heard that particular, but I tend to go with that. And it's like what I said, they can attach to two things in our soul. So um, it's it, the better way of like even scripturally, if we study it out in scripture, uh, it's more it's they use the word demoniz demonization, I think, which is more oppression than it is possession. Uh, possession is you don't see it very often a lot of it is oppression and 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 i think even more more so if you if you understand oppression it's like something from the outside coming at you right and 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 demons will they'll just attach to something like that just that's that's a good place for them to live it's like um germs there's a good environment for germs you can you can make your body a good environment for germs or a bad environment uh i think we heard years ago like eat live food because germs don't live well in live food they eat well they live well in dead food and which is what we mostly eat right so you create an environment where demons can thrive in in your soul area and things that are going on in your soul I'm good with that. It's like a, it's just agreement and what you come into alignment with in the soul that allows them to attach. That's that open door. Right. That's why in inner healing they talk about renouncing a lot. Yeah. Um, you you can make pacts with your words in in, in life, and uh, we do that a lot of times. It does. Uh, I'm I'm just kind of rolling through my. That's what I'm thinking, and that's why I'm I'm having a hard time with the answer. It does relate. Um, same chapter. Maybe not the same page, but in the same chapter of the content. <laughs> yeah, you guys are putting me on the spot tonight. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so binding and loosing, yeah. Right. And no, go ahead. Uh, I, do you agree that there are three things that we, we deal with? We, our flesh, which is not demons. So 
sometimes it's just a flesh problem. It's, it's a problem. A lot of times it's a flesh problem. Yeah, and then sometimes it's demonic oppression or influence yes. or whatever that you allow in because of your flesh. And then it's our spiritual realm. You know, so that is the battlefield, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you for know, our soul. But sometimes we blame everything on demons, and I don't think it's really the demons. Sometimes no. No, a lot of times we want to blame the devil when you did it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and Absolutely. Then make you do it. <laughs> not, not, not so much the things that we do, um, <coughs> but, you know, Paul spoke of the, the law of sin in us. Yeah. And, and it was as if we're absolved of it because, as he said, the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. to that that a lot of our sin is is not intentional but through the process of repentance we acknowledge that that we played a part in it that that makes a sense yeah um my my belief is we are subject to the nature of sin before christ in christ I believe that he has, at the root, taken an axe to the very nature of sin. We have to come into agreement with what Christ did in order to understand that we're free from the nature of sin. And I think that was the battle Paul had. Paul was legitimately, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. And I find in, in me that... That law, I think he says it that way, you know, find in me, there's that struggle. And he says at the end of that whole section, he says, thank God, Christ. And so he's recognizing that in myself, and as, if I use my willpower, if I use my own strength, I am going to fall back on the sin nature and not draw from the nature of God. The nature of God, like I mentioned earlier, is coming from that spirit, from the spirit of God in us. And the nature of God, we're actually free from those things. <clears throat> when I was very young and trying to figure some of this stuff out, through some of my greatest struggles, I discovered revelations of the Lord. And, and the greatest revelation I think I ever discovered was this one that we're talking about right now. When I tried to get myself free from something because I wanted to please God, and I could not. What I wanted to do, I could not do. And the thing that I didn't want to do, I would do over and over again. I say, God, I don't want to do this, but I, there's something in me that's forcing me to do it. It's, and you tell people that, it's like, oh, yeah, you can control that. Yeah, go ahead and try it. You cannot control it. And it's, it's sooner or later, it takes you over. And that's where people fall into this trap all over and over and over again. And I woke up one day and I said, God, I'm, I'm so tired. I can't, I'm losing this battle. I don't know what to do. I give up. And God said, finally, when I gave up his strength, his grace, boom, took over and I was free. I mean, not not months later, not years later, I was free that day when I said, God, I am weak and I cannot overcome this. I give up. I am sorry and I don't know what to do. I was set free in that moment. It was amazing. And that was a revelation to me <clears throat> that I've used over the years that I've realized I cannot in my strength as a man in my willpower, in, in my forcefulness, I cannot act godly by nature. I have to give up and allow Christ in me. That's why the, the greatest revelation I think I've ever received is Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, yet... I live, not I, but Christ in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. 
That's the greatest revelation I think I've ever received. It's the gospel. <clears throat> he paid a price so we don't have to. But we're always trying to pay a price. Whether we think so or not, we're always trying to pay a price. So, yeah. <clears throat> and I don't know where we got to there from here, from wherever we were. <laughs> Binding and loosing. Because if that were the case, I've seen people who are battling so many different <coughs> things. And as much as they try to make choices or make some choices or rebuke it, it's on their back like a monkey in a circus. Yeah. So I think it's all of these, you can't really tease it out nicely and compartmentalize it. It truly is this big ball of stuff and Christ within has to unravel that. And that's why we're so turned upside down and broken because we are trying all these yeah. different things for many reasons. And unless we just get down and be centered, like you said, I give up, but pay attention to what Christ is doing, he just takes us. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a, it's a lifelong Right? I mean, I wish I could say once and done. But it's lifelong. As a matter of fact, I've gone through like an onion layers of getting healed, set free, coming into freedom. And it's like, oh, I'm free. No, got a ways to go still. <laughs> got, there's a couple more layers. We're going to get there. Just God says, just give me a little time. You're not ready right now. You're too raw. The, the wound is too open right now, so let me wait till you get the scar taken care of and, you know, everything's good. There's no more pain. You can't feel it anymore. It's just a scar, but you can't feel it. And then we'll go to the next level. And uh, mm, I'll tell you, uh, I remember even years ago, I, I said to the Lord, I said, why, what, why am I going through the stuff I'm going through right now? And, and the Lord said, well, you said you wanted me to use you. I said, yeah. He said, well, I need less of you. Job didn't get an answer. Not right away. He did in the end. Yeah, he got an answer at the end. <laughs> so nice if, if God wasn't so mysterious. That was the word I was going to use. <laughs> you know, I said, because I think the enemy is so brazen and in your face and whack, whack, whack. Well, here's the good news, okay? Because we don't want to leave you on a sour note. The, <laughs> No, the good, the good news is that Christ won. Amen. The good news is that he paid for us to be winners. Yes. The good news is that he has intended and purposed a destiny for every one of us to be made whole and to come into his presence now and then. And so the good news is we can do this. The good news is we're going to make it because one greater than us has already gone forth, gone over, and he's taken care of it. So the good news is, don't worry about all this. Just keep focusing. Just keep pressing towards him because he will take you into all that. And I'll say this, just trying to, to bring some of this around. 
because we can get so focused that, oh, man, I've got all these attacks coming against me. The devil just, he's just really coming at me. You know, I've, in my lifetime, and just take this with a grain of salt and hear me out for a minute. I don't give the devil much time in my life. I don't give him much time at all because he's not a problem for me. He's been defeated. I know he's been defeated. So even if he comes like a tax, uh, for me, most of the time, the enemy is the gum on a 100-degree day that you step in when you get out of your car in the parking lot because someone spit it out on the pavement. And now I got gum on my shoe that is a little bit aggravating but it's no more than a little bit aggravating. That's Satan for me. Okay? And that's not because I'm so big. It's because God is so big. And, uh, you know, I've, I've told stories like this before. I've been in Haiti. I've been in these different countries. In Haiti, they were doing horrible things. I mean, horrible things were happening even during the night and while we're there. And voodoo drums are going off. They had voodoo services. The Catholic Church is in Haiti, which is in a lot of places. This is what blows my mind. The Catholic Church allows voodoo rituals to take place in the Catholic Church as part of all that. They're okay with it. And yet, anyway, so they're doing all these voodoo rituals and they're playing all these drums. And the team I'm with, most of them are freaking out. And uh, one, of the, one young guy and myself, we were the same age, same age, so I was young too. But uh, we slept like babies. And we got up the next day and we just looked at each other and it's like, the voodoo drums put me to sleep. <laughs> While everybody else was fear, terror, ooh, there's demons floating around, they're calling forth the spirits and doing all this junk. If you know God, <clears throat> I can remember some of the teachers at the, where we were going to school before I made the trip. One of the teachers, they had been, and they said, now you got to be careful because as soon as the plane doors open, it's going to be like a cloud. It, you'll just feel it like a cloud. Darkness will just hit you. And I, and I had to actually talk to the group. I'm just a kid, okay? I'm in my 20s, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to this group that I'm, I'm leading to Haiti, and I sat and talked to them, and I said, is this the kind of God that we're, we're going to believe in? We're gonna is this the kind of God we're going to travel with? That you believe that when the plane doors open, we're going to be hit with darkness and it's going to overpower us? I mean, is this... I, I, didn't, I couldn't even talk about the spiritual leader that was telling us that, but it's like, is this the way we're going to go? I said, we may as well not go. Don't even pack your bags. Because I ain't going anywhere where I know I'm going to be defeated before I get off the plane. I said, I said, demons don't have that much power. Someone just wrote me an email about three days ago. I haven't heard from them in probably 15 years. That Out of the blue, they just <coughs> started thinking about me, and they wrote me this email. And they said uh, they were impressed by my faith and, and just reaching out to me. And, and they said, I remember one thing that you said. It's n I've never forgotten it. And I'm like, I wonder what that is. And he said, we were standing outside, and there was this big storm coming up in Asheville, up in, up in North Carolina, this big storm, thunder, and all this stuff, and I don't remember what he said, something fearful about it all, and, and, and I just stood there, and I just said, I, didn't, I don't even remember saying this, I said, my God is bigger than this storm, and he said that statement rocked his life, and I'm like, well, good, um, but that should be something that every one of us says without questioning. My God is bigger than the storm. And, but he remembered that. And it's like, when, 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 you, when you know Jesus Christ, you get, see, our, sadly, we put way too much focus on the problems. Even when we start talking about maturing in our soul, getting out of trouble, and I know I'm mentioning, you know, we're all broken in some areas. We've got brokenness. But look at what God is doing and look at what God is bringing you into and look at focus up. Christ is ahead. He's up there. He's, up, he's in front of us. 
and we're going towards that, and he has made it possible for us to get there. It's not impossible. It's possible. All we do is take hold of it. Only believe. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> okay. I didn't get through what I was going to get through. Evil spirits, or yeah. mm -hmm. yes, yes, they were, you know she was engaging. It was just beyond anything. You should be like, okay, what do you see? Are they ghosts? <laughs> Why? Because I don't see. But so you know, as we're talking about spirits attaching themselves, and it just makes me think about, okay, what what doors were open for you to bring that back, or is that even? Not, not, I'm not suggesting that one has to. Fear alone. I've had my experience. You know, a lot of things. She was in fear um, on that trip. Fear alone. If I mean, you can kind of allow yourself to be traumatized by it. That alone could have. I found that I had. Yep. Yeah, I found that I had to protect myself even in counseling. Mm -hmm. um, counseling people, they bring their trash. They bring everything they've got, right? And and I'm counseling people, and most time. I mean, here we like to think as, you know, Americans that we're cleaner. We're already cleaned up more because we've known God more or something like that. Let me just put to rest that thing where we got as much trash as anybody else. But I can remember going through a lot of counseling. And when this first start happened, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on because my mind, I would get thoughts that had never entered my mind just junk all kinds of weird stuff would come into my mind and I don't know who I talked to where I figured it out or I read it or what happened but I realized that there was it was transferring from the people that I was counseling and as I'm listening to them they're bringing whatever spirits they got going on whatever attached to them coming in and it's trying to get in me and it's not originating in me it's not coming from me but it's trying to get in me and, and I would have to just kind of do a little cleansing, right, in the spirit, not weird stuff, but just a little bit of breaking it off. And it's one of the reasons that I do some counseling in my home. Darlene and I do some counseling in our home. And I do some counseling outside of my home because I don't want to have to deal with whatever people. I don't want you leaving your trash in my house. Take it with you. Does that make sense? <laughs> we, you know, we want to get rid of it, but I don't want to have to deal with it. Uh, <clears throat> and stuff like this happens. I went to uh, this place on the Pacific Coast a few times to minister, and, I, and I've talked about this over the years a lot. Uh, I was ministering to this bunch of uh, ministerial students from the mountains of Oaxaca, and as I'm ministering to them, I'm realizing as I'm speaking to them, I'm trying to share with them more mature messages for students, Bible students, and I'm realizing that they're not mature. And all of a sudden, demons are manifesting in this group of students. And it's like, okay, I need to get some of these guys saved, and I need to get them, you know, it's like I'm, I'm getting the fish just on the hook, and I've got to gut it and clean it and scale it and lay it out and I went to the director of the school after like the first or second session I said what's the deal I said <clears throat> I've come in to teach Bible college students they're supposed to be saved a little bit sanctified a little bit ready to to preach the gospel to other people these are these are fresh off the boat I mean these 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 are fresh caught and he said well we get them out of the mountains and and they just you know they 
they'll just hear about God and they just get on fire. They want to do something for God. And we put them right in the school. I said, well, you should have warned me. So I'm doing, I'm doing delivery. I'm, I'm, I'm casting out demons out of these kids. I mean, to one, one kid, he, he cracked me up because I could hear him the whole time. I would call people out, I, and I do this a lot in ministry, but this time I was calling them out for deliverance. So I'd go in and I'd say, you, come up here. And, and they'd come up, and I'd start praying for them. I mean, one girl started writhing around, and I had to cast demons out of her, get that taken care of. And then i call somebody out, start ministering a prophetic word, start breaking stuff, and start casting demons out one after another. And this guy's sitting back there, and he kept telling all his colleagues, said, it's going to be okay, it's okay, you'll, you'll be okay, just go on up. He's trying to encourage him, just go on up when I call him out, just, just go on up there, it's going to be okay. And then I called him out, <laughs> and he like changed colors. He's like, oh, no, no, I said, no, yes, you, you come out now. And uh, he had a spirit of, <clears throat> I don't even know how to name spirits, but it, it, it was a murder, like a, a spirit on him. And I said, what on earth is going on here? I mean, because I don't, I just don't like dealing with all that junk. <clears throat> I do it, and it's like I said earlier, I just don't give place to the devil. Just get out. Get out of the service. Get out of here. I don't want to mess with you. Let these people alone. And I remember praying for him, and, and, and he got delivered. And I found out, I won't go into all the details, but his brother had come in a previous year and tried to kill himself while he was at the school. And uh, it, it was like a spirit of murder. I mean, just like self, self mutilation, murder. It was just, ter just terrible, ter terrible stuff that's in these villages because they worship all kinds of, of stuff, even though they have the Catholic junk. That's why, you know, I talk, and please don't be offended, but I hear people talk when I first came to Tallahassee, it's like, uh, we've got a lot of great Catholic friends, and I, and I do too, and I, I love them, and I believe they're saved, and I believe they're Christian, and I believe all that, but you haven't seen the Catholic Church in other nations. You haven't seen the tragedy. You haven't seen, I've seen some of the stuff that goes on and how they, the mixture of demonic with Catholicism takes place in these other nations uh, where they parade around skeletons and, and, you know, they're, 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 they're worshiping this skeleton and, and they have mummies in the church and it's just crazy stuff. And there's all these demons that get attached to all this junk and people are worshiping all this stuff. So, of course, they've got all this junk in them. Anyway. Okay, I'll stop. And uh, I'll probably continue this a little bit next week. But because um, we haven't talked about how to fight. But amen. Anybody else? All hearts clear? Good. Praise God. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for starting out the new year, and, and uh, we'll move forward. Amen? God bless you. This is the first Wednesday.